parents and leaders of this community, we've seen in we've seen the problem of drugs and people, homeless people in the streets and how they live. And we need to educate your, ourselves because we only see them like only the top of what the story that they're going through. Tonight, you are so lucky and so privileged that we're able to hear it from somebody who lived in the streets for from his teenagers to his adulthood. He's going to tell us more about that and how he survived and what they went through and how they met their, they, they have that love story as well. We're going to talk about that and all the struggles that they had, they went through and the places that they were at and and, and and the hope that he was able to pull his life from that black hole and now he's working and he they have a family now, they have two children, a boy and a girl. They're living in Grishol, renting a house, so he's working, both of them are working. Do you have a car? Did he drive the car? Has that got a car now? So there is hope. We just need to be educated and know what they're going through so that we would know how to help them. So fellow Rotarians, guests, and friends, I'm introduced to you our speaker tonight. This is Jesse jo Dufour and Joel. So I gonna have to do this like an interview like that. I promise Jesse it's gonna be a conversation. So Jesse, tell us the story and how it started. At what age did you just start to live in the streets and why it happened? It was an unfortunate event. Yeah, I lived a good life when I was younger. I went to Canada's Wonderland, it was all good. My mom got sick with leukemia at 12 years old and I lost my mom. So we were in Winnipeg and we had moved to Manitoba because my dad wanted to move on and my mom was a big part of my life. So we moved to Manitoba and my dad ended up getting really sick. So he also had three heart attacks and he passed away. So <coughs> Can I, here, you can move closer, please. You can move here. So if you can, here, yeah, move here goes the other ones. I want you to. And Jesse, if you are comfortable, just to Yeah, yeah. And then so, you so lost your parents. Yeah. So my sister ended up going. So they were going to put her in foster care. My uncle said, "Well, we'll take the kids in." And I just, I didn't feel like that was the right thing to do. My uncle ended up taking my sister, and they were going to take me in. They, they won't take you. They were taking they me were in. So I was at my uncle's house and I just got in a big argument with him. I didn't want to stay. I was stubborn and I was 13 years old. So I ran away. I just went out in the middle of the winter time. Well, this was, pardon me, before we went to Winnipeg, we were in Rivers. My father passed away. Rivers is two and a half hours from Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Yeah. So my father had passed away. And we were sitting in the house with my auntie that was staying with us, keeping us there until the funeral woman could be with the kids, me and my sister. Yeah. So we were sitting there and we ended up going to my uncle's house through the area. We get there and my uncle wanted to keep us there and just have a whole new plan. I didn't want to stay there. I ended up running away and I just started walking outside of Winnipeg. It took me three, four hours to walk outside, 13 years old got on the highway and just started hitchhiking. Started hitchhiking, I got all the way to just past the town, Rivers, where I was at. It was like three hours outside of Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. It was so cold in the winter time that I regretted my decision as soon as I was out there. Yeah, I was too far to go back. Too far to go back. <laughs> Freezing cold. Yeah. I sat on the side of the highway, I got up with this ball in my face on. 13 years old, I was freezing. Nowhere to go this way, I can't get to a gas station. Can't go back, I've walked too far outside of town. Yeah. It's cold, I'm not gonna make it. I was sitting there in the snow like this, crying. I woke up in somebody's truck, soaking wet, because I was completely covered in snow, and I thought I was in his truck. Hitchhiked me through. So I finally get to, just by the Saskatchewan border, going towards Calgary. Still not knowing where I'm going. Still a 13 year old kid, still scared. 
still hitchhiking. I got picked up on the highway, threw my bag in the back of the guy's truck at the gas station where I was dropped off. The guy took off with all my stuff. Threw all your stuff? Threw off all my stuff. <laughs> took my, all your stuff. My bag, everything that I had, took all my stuff. So now I'm in Saskatchewan border, freezing cold. What do I do? Nothing. Yeah. No change. I don't remember any phone numbers, nothing. I'm scared. I go to the truck stop. Sitting in the truck stop, just crying by the bathroom. Crying. The trucker came up and asked me where I was going. 13 year old kid, I'm kind of scared. Don't know what to do. I say, I just want to go somewhere. Just, I just want to go to Calgary. I just want to get out of here. I just want to go to Calgary. I don't want to go back there. The truck driver drove me to Calgary. So it was a long drive from the Saskatchewan border all the way to Calgary, sat in the back of his truck, learned so much, it was actually quite a cool experience. Mm -hmm. Just going through it all. Yeah. Getting to Calgary, now being homeless in Calgary at 13 years old, what do you do? So you you have nowhere else to go? Nowhere. So you're in the streets? In the streets. Yeah, so, so how do you know what started? So the streets, there's the mustard seed in Calgary, is a place where you can go at any age, you can be there at 6 o'clock p.m. and you get to stay the night or you have to be out by 6 o'clock the next day. We didn't end up getting any beds. I didn't get any beds in there. I got in a lot of fights when I was down there. Just young and then it got really cold that you can't stay in Calgary, there's nowhere to go. I'm sitting out in the alleyway, sitting by the vents coming out of buildings just to stay warm. Nowhere to go. I learned how to break dance when I was younger and play hockey sack, which is kind of how I survived. I was in Calgary playing hockey sack and I used to break dance and just do like 100 push-ups for change on the street yeah. and make a little bit of money for food for whatever food. I could. Yeah. That's where I met my girlfriend at the time, Stephanie. Yeah. She was staying at the W, YWCA. Yeah. She was staying there, yeah. 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 But she yeah. was staying there. I could never get a bed anywhere. So she was also a runaway kid. She was just a little bit older than I was. She was 14. And uh, I can't live in Calgary, I can't stay here, it's too cold. Yeah. I can't eat, I can't stay anywhere, there's lots of homeless people here, I can't, there's nowhere to stay. Yeah. There's no programs at nighttime that can help you out. So in Calgary, when it's so cold, people are just left on the streets to just do drugs and break into shit. Yeah. So that's all there is to do. No programs are out there to help you. So when you, that's why I said, you was your girlfriend, you were together. You were together. You were trying to yeah. survive in Trying the to streets. survive, and I said, yeah. Where can I go? That's warm. Yeah, now where do you go? So how did it all start? Like what did you do? Just so... Just trying to get through every night. Just absolutely freezing. So staying underneath the bridges in the winter time. Yeah. Staying underneath the bridges to keep warm. So the one guy I was panhandling and he asked me like, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? And didn't really occur to me what to do. What to mm -hmm. do? Where do I go? What do I do? Of course, I mentioned to go to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So this is where I kind of got a little crazy. So I ended up hitchhiking from Calgary, walked out of Calgary, about 14 at that time, hitchhiking outside of Calgary. Both of you? No, I had Just left, you? I left Stephanie there because she had a place to stay. She was at the YWCA. Oh, okay, the YWCA. So she had an obligation to stay there. Yeah. I said, I'm going to Vancouver, I can't stay here. Yeah. It's yeah. so cold. I'm not making any money, street kids are not. There's nothing, mm -hmm. there's nothing. No programs. Yeah. So as a hitchhiking through BC, there was so much programs in every little town as you were going because it was like the hitchhiking path through like Calgary to BC. It was like the best, there was so many hitchhikers on the road. Oh. So many programs for people to go to and the- Oh, could you have a place that we can Yeah, a place where you can go. Okay. Every little town had a mission where you can go into and they give you a toothbrush, jewelry, a pair of socks and kind of go on your way. So hitchhiking through, I eventually get to Vancouver about a week and a half later. I don't know anything. Vancouver is a very scary city when you're young. Finally get on the train and I go downtown. And I'm 14 years old and I'm starving, but this city is beautiful. It's, yeah, yeah. Is there a program there too that gives you? There is absolutely food? lots of programs. Okay. So I was going and I walked and I get up to a street, Davy Street. I don't know if anybody knows Vancouver. But Davy and Granville Street. 
I sat up. At I know where to find So I sat up at the Danny's Panhandle. So just just warm up, put my head up, I'm gonna get some change. I'm gonna find some food, it's okay. You were dancing in the street that time? What were I you stopped doing, doing that. I okay. stopped doing that. That was in Alberta. Oh, okay. So here I go to BC, it's warm. I don't really have to, there's lots of stuff going on. It's a very alive city. Okay. So at nighttime in Vancouver, they have, well, I'll tell you the part where I was sitting out front of Danny's first. This was a drug store. Okay. I was sitting out front of Danny's panhandling, two o'clock in the morning comes around. And all these men start coming out of these bars. I was in the gay area of town, completely unaware of what was going on. Being 14 years old, you don't know what's going on. So you see all these guys coming out, like absolutely naked, walking by you at 14 years old, right downtown Vancouver, like absolutely. Are they gay? Absolutely. Okay. That part of downtown where I just kind of went towards was the absolute gayest part of Vancouver. And what time of the, the Two night? in the morning, yeah. Two in the morning. Very sexual. You want to see that? You go to the club. There's very sexual activity going on there. Okay. And all it took was one guy that kicked me and asked me, you want to make some money? Yeah. And right away I thought, oh no. And he threw a bag of crystal meth on me. Oh, that's how it started. That's how it started. Okay. Bring me back 30 bucks. I didn't even know what it was. What it was. Okay. I had no idea what it was. So he gave me a little bit of a rundown on it. just go teaching you go teach what you do. Yeah, you just come back here at five o'clock and you bring your money. And not an hour and a half later I had fifty bucks. It sold it like that. It was quick money. And quick money. Yeah. Three days later I was picking up ounces. It was quick money. Boom. Boom. Oh. Fourteen years old. I'm telling you where it is. Tell you. The gay scene was just money. All gay guys wanted was math. I hit the money phone. I hit it. It was amazing. Not really amazing, but it was a time where when well, you needed the money. When you needed the money. money. Yeah. By the time I was 15 years old, we were moving maybe two or three pounds of meth a week on the streets. Yeah. Still nowhere to live. <clears throat> so paranoid. Smoking so much meth, so paranoid. You're taking it too, and oh, selling it too. Taking it, smoking okay. all my problems. Everything. All your problems, whatever you are in your Everything was gone. Okay. So, sitting there, always paranoid. Always paranoid. And then we got into, well, homeless people at nighttime. So there was a program where we called her mama, which was a lady that went around in a wheelchair. She was paralyzed. Uh -huh. Every morning at 2 o'clock in the morning, she would run down Hastings, Granville Street, yeah. Davy, go down, go down Burrard, up, and then back down to Hastings through Granville and hand out food to the homeless. Mm -hmm. Everybody would protect her. She was there, alive with faith every single night. And all the homeless people would come for food and hot coffee and hot chocolate. And she was there the entire time I was out there. Mm -hmm. Saved everybody's lives that were hungry. Mm -hmm. She was always there. It was something that was. And that's the thing at nighttime in Vancouver that there was programs where they were open at nighttime. There was a place called Dust to Dawn that was open on, uh, I forget what street it was, Gerard Street. Dust to Dawn is what it's called. And there's a place where you can go and get high and just be safe. There was counselors that walked around. All the couches had like scabies and bugs. And I had body lice so bad that my clothes I bet you I didn't change my socks in three or four months, and I didn't give a shit. I was so high that it didn't matter. Is it always? I looked so cool. Yeah. Oh, I was so high with my backpack on. Whoa. <laughs> Sleeping bag with 5,000 bucks in my pocket. Oh, yeah. Nowhere to live. And I opened my shirt like this, and there just thousands of bugs all over my body. And bugs you don't feel like because you're you always don't feel high, I'm right? always so high. Yeah. So high all the time. So now I want you to share with them, like, what do you feel when you get to be hooked on drugs, and why do you want to be always high, and then the feeling afterwards when it wears down. So when you take crystal meth, you smoke crystal meth for the first time. It's the absolute best euphoric feeling you can ever experience in your life. It gives you the the open mindness of you can accomplish anything. You're like invincible. Yeah. Invincible. You can take freaking radio and turn it into a cell phone just with your mind and your teching out with your little screwdrivers and all that stuff. Yeah. Get the sidewalk in the streets and your mind is just so clear. 
think you look so cool, but then you sober up and you're like, what the fuck am I wearing? Like it's, it's the feeling, you chase that feeling of being high, and you'll never experience that feeling again. So then you resort to needles. So when I got into the needles, that first shot that I gave in my foot of crystal meth was that same feeling that I had when I first smoked it. It was just, I felt it through every part of my veins. Oh my, it was just, oh, it was just that feeling. You know, you just get the chills and you just like wake up. And it's that all the time. Okay. That's the power and the feeling you get. Smoking cocaine is, or snorting cocaine is something different. It's is gone. It different it's gone effects? after about two hours. You smoke $10 worth of crystal meth, you're fucking high for 14 hours. Oh, on so ten dollars. Longer effect on your body. On ten dollars. But ten dollars and cocaine is more okay. expensive. We were going through an eight ball in Manitoba, four hundred dollars every two days. Oh my god, that's a lot. And selling it to the whole freaking town. So that's why people are uh, going yeah. to using the meth because it's cheaper. Or you just turn your coke into crack. So you take your cocaine, yeah. you put it in hot water, you add baking soda, and you stir it up. That's okay. going to bond into a piece of rock. That's your crack. Oh. So people bust that. Oh, wow. Okay. Like people That's bust that up and they sell half coke, half crack. That's five piece nuggets, ten piece nuggets. Mm. So you triple your money. Oh, you That's take fine. an eight ball of cocaine, put it in a pot, and stir it up with some water, baking soda. I can turn that shit to seven hundred bucks. But piece it up, right? Oh, I see. So this how you. Uh, so you piece it up. Yeah. Crystal mass, same thing. I'd go pick up three, four pounds of crystal meth yeah. from my dealer. I'd wait outside the welfare office. Fuck people come with me, 790 bucks, the whole check. Yeah. Take everything. They're broke for two weeks. They're broke for the whole month. I got the whole check. Wow. Wow. It's that addictive. It's yeah. that good. So you tell us the, uh, like, how it feels when, when the drugs wears off, and that's why you clamor for more. So, Meth really doesn't, or it takes a long time for meth to wear off. So even if you don't have it for like two weeks, you start talking about it, you'll get high again. So it's, it stays in your system for a very long time. I get goosebumps on you here just talking about it. Yeah. Not high, but it's just, it's that, <laughs> it's that good. Yeah, yeah. It's so then your heart's pumping. Everything is just so clear. You can walk around all night. Like I was so high on Granville Street, McDonald's. You know the Granville and McDonald's? Yeah, yeah. So in that alleyway right there, I was so high on crystal meth one day I stood in the alleyway and I was standing there. And I was staring at the other end of the alleyway. I swear it was somebody else staring at me back. And I'm like, I'm not gonna let it win. I'm just staring at him, staring at him. Sun comes up, it's a freaking mop sticking out of the garbage can. I'm staring at a freaking mop. mop. <laughs> Ten hours staring at a mop. Ten I'm hours! Sweating. Oh my God. sweating, my face is sweating and it stinks. It stinks. Yeah, because there's stuff, there's programs there to go in to the have a shower and stuff. Yeah. The showers last for the day I want when I'm high. And when I finally do, my socks come off like Velcro. They were stuck to my foot. Ooh, so right. gross. I yeah. put them back on. As soon as I smoke a bowl in the bathroom, those socks are clean in my head. Everything's just normal again. Heroin is a little bit different. First time I did heroin, same thing in Granville, the subway right across the street from McDonald's. Mm -hmm. I did heroin for the first time. I thought it was ketamine. I grabbed a light bulb, smashed the light bulb, wiped the powder off of it, and I put heroin on the powder, on the light bulb. I smoked the heroin through a straw. About 15, 16 years old by now is when I started doing heroin. I started smoking that. I gnawed out like this, I dropped everything. I sat on the toilet in Subway with the door locked for like seven hours. My ass had a big bruise until the, dog, the cops were banging on the door, mm -hmm. getting me out. I sat there for seven hours, it felt like 10 minutes. And nobody went no, there? No, there's, drug, there's drugs everywhere downtown Vancouver. Oh, okay. That's how heroin was. I puked all over the place, because that's the first thing you do when you smoke heroin, is puke. Anybody does heroin, you puke. You, when you're high, when you take it? The very first time you do it, you puke. Okay. That's it's just true. something that, they call it chasing drag, and you're sitting there like this. No matter how hard you try, you can't open your eyes because you just, the hair will So it's a different effect. It's a different effect. Okay. So that's why people take crystal meth and heroin to kind of give you that same 
So now I'm feeling, like I have the are you face. still able to focus? Okay, so now can you tell us the effect when it wears out? When you don't have what heroin, you, what do you feel? even after the first time you do heroin, if you don't have it for the next day, it's like you have the flu times 10. It looks like you're on heroin, but they're just that sick. It's called being down sick. And that's from the heroin? That's from the heroin. How about the, the cocaine? What is the... When, when I finally met my wife when I was 25 years old, when I got out of Vancouver, I introduced her to cocaine in Manitoba. It's what we moved to Manitoba to kind of bring our kids up. We both had young kids, our son and daughter. They were about five and eight, I guess, at the time. In Vancouver, you no. already have children there? No, this is when I moved to Manitoba with her. This is after. Okay. So I came to Manitoba after all the Vancouver stuff. Oh, you went back to Manitoba? This is after the Vancouver. Okay. You were talking about cocaine? Yeah. So I was talking about cocaine. Okay, all right, all right, got it. So when I moved to Manitoba, I met her at one of the butcher shops when I was 25 years old. After Wait, the Vancouver. Was, you were working at the, was the butcher shop at the time? In yeah. Calgary. In Calgary. But you were also using cocaine? No, so she wasn't using cocaine. Was, oh, you were not. It wasn't just in. I was still in Okay. Yeah. So when I met her in Calgary after I got kicked out of Vancouver from all the drug and the crime that we did there, 31 convictions, I can't really go anywhere. And uh, so when we got to Manitoba after all the partying in Vancouver, I grew up, I had met her in Calgary. We moved to Manitoba for our kids to grow up, not in the city, but in a small town, Brandon, Manitoba. I don't know if anybody ever heard of it. Brandon? Yeah. It's a beautiful town. It's a beautiful town. My kids are going good, both honor roll kids in school. I was a butcher there, making good money, but there's fucking nothing to do. So I resorted back to what I know. Selling drugs. Selling drugs. What can I find right now? Okay. Within, I don't know, maybe two months, we had the whole town and my family, like my sister, wanting because she moved out she's older now she was around too the whole town coming to our house. our house so my kids are five and eight years old and my son throughout the weekends where we had big parties two or three hundred people over and just cocaine everywhere oh this is a cocaine party oh, yeah. every weekend every weekend every weekend but you're same time working as a butcher yeah, yeah. that's um, when i got there maybe four hours of sleep a week because we're selling coke all the time. Yeah, and, and by the way, Jesse worked as a butcher because you said they don't... They don't do criminal record checks. They don't do criminal records, and that's the only job he could do. The past three jobs from Calgary, Manitoba, to here. Yeah, because he had 32 convictions. 31 convictions, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I could have got a job at Superstore, Sobeys. I passed all the tests for butchers. <laughs> or what's on my record is they won't. He won't hire him. Yeah because of his criminal records. Um, can we bring it back a little bit? Because you had you had two children uh, before you met. Uh, so when I was in Vancouver, I started selling crystal meth, just about 15, 16 years old. A girlfriend from Calgary had followed me up there after she was done with the YWCA. She had came out to BC to find me. So she was out there with me, and you know she was following me around like a dog as I was Selling crystal meth on the streets. I had my three guys with me. I had a big uh, native guy that I'd give an eight ball a week to follow me around and just take care of any debts that I had. It was just, he would just go and just take care of anything. I'd give him drugs, he'd do whatever I want. Anything I want. Stephanie would follow me around. The kids were conceived in like parking lots outside. Just wherever. Wherever. Just wherever. We were both dirty, we both had scabies, we were both disgusting and still just you know doing whatever on the streets and then she got pregnant so pregnant with Emily which is my first daughter she got put into like a home mm -hmm. where me, and my, me and Stephanie were still on the streets and then she got pregnant again I went to prison for a while because I got caught making crystal meth I went in two and a half years got out and both my kids uh, I had had a visit with both my kids before I went to jail, sorry. And uh, that's when we had signed the papers for them to be adopted together because we were unable to take care of my children on the streets. 
and none of us were willing to become clean. It was just something we weren't able to do. We had no address, we had no place to live. And even with those kids, you still have not thought of... Nothing. And they were both born under seven pounds. They were both meth babies. Sapphire had a big flat spot on her head. Now she does makeup for Halloween artists in Japan. And she's big makeup, but she's doing really well. Mm -hmm. I've never met my children in Vancouver in person. Oh. I say good night to them and good morning to them on my phone every day. I try to do a Skype call with them, because how I found them and got contact with them was their mother had moved to Alberta after all the Vancouver stuff. She had found them through an obituary that their their foster, foster parents, foster parents, somebody had died, and then their last name, the name that I'd given the children, had lined up and binged on my Nexus computer. So we looked into it, and sure enough, it was my two daughters that I'd given up for adoption in Vancouver. And what age are they? They're right now. They're twenty and twenty. That time when you knew uh, about this was just like not too long ago. This was oh, okay. like this four years ago. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago I got in contact with them. So my wife had set up a Skype call to, for me to FaceTime my daughters for the first time after all this Vancouver stuff. And I have two children of my own now, and I want them to meet their brothers and sisters. Well, as soon as they were on the face on the on the screen on the screen, I couldn't even look without crying my face off. I couldn't get one word out with my life depended on it. I couldn't. <coughs> I just sat there and cried. I couldn't do anything. So we shut that off, and now we send snaps. Snaps, but we just take little pictures. Snapchats. Yeah, we just take pictures back and okay. forth, and they still get me very emotional. But now, my two older daughters talk to my two kids I have with her, my son and my daughter. So they all talk, and my daughter talk. My daughter, my wife talks to my daughters on a daily basis also. So it's very good that we're all that is good. we're all talking. No, um, so were you were were you in prison that time when you said that you almost lost your arms? That was from gangrene. Yeah, so his arms went gangrene because So yeah, back in upper crystal meth in Vancouver, all the parkades underneath the buildings were all open. There was always a place to go, always undergrounds, downtown Vancouver's all full of sky rises. There's lots of places to go underneath. So what we did to make extra money was we jumped a mailman, we beat him up, and we took his keys. We took the mailman's keys, and I copied those keys with a Dremel. And you know those dog clips you clip the dog with? You just clip the dog, we took those, and we copied those keys and make them just like the mail key. So that one key will get you in every single building in the city. Being, being, being the mailman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a federal charge. You get caught stealing is different. You get caught with that key, it's a federal charge. Okay. So it's a mail key. But you sit there and the same key would open up every building. You go in there like you live there. Open up, click, the door opens. Bang, go to the elevator, parkade. Go down to the parkade. Everybody's storage units are there. Everything. And they're all made out of wood back then. It was all just wood. Okay. Little pieces of little strip of wood with a little padlock on it. Mm -hmm. But we'd sit there all night and just pop those locks off. And I'm talking, we take hope chests and it's very bad karma. Don't, like we did, we grabbed everything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to talk about some of the stuff we took, but it was just very, very bad karma. Okay. Just smashing stuff that we couldn't sell, whatever. So I started selling those mail keys to all the street kids. Oh. Street kids, go get me everything you can. And I'll buy it off you with that. So they, yeah. every morning, I'd go and walk downtown Vancouver and on the street, there's always like a, a lean to over top of the sidewalk. It's always raining. So there'd always be homeless people lined up with blankets yeah. and everything that they stole from the night before. Oh, all my profits would be from all the stuff that they stole. All this cool shit. Oh yeah, I'm taking this, taking this. Go to my dealers with all this merch and shit. He doesn't want any of it. Story of my life. That's just the way it was. Every night I did the same thing. <laughs> now you tell us about your gangrene. So the gangrene, yeah, I went and picked up a lot of dope. I picked up so much dope and I was awake for a bunch of 10 days. So high. So I just went down to a park gate really deep, maybe five, six levels down. Found an abandoned car with a tarp over top of it. I sat in front of the tarp. 
front feet underneath the car so nobody could see me in the morning mm -hmm. when they come and go to work or whatever. So I'm sitting there bagging up my dope while I'm falling asleep with a big bowl of crystal meth in my mouth. Oh. Well, I fell asleep like that and I woke up and it had eaten all the skin on my arm. Oh, how strong That's how strong it was. It's very, uh, it's very gritty. You hear it in the bag, it goes. It's very gritty and corrosive. When you smoke it for the first time, you get speed bumps. That's what they call speed bumps in your mouth. You get sores all over. It's from the Can chemical you burn inside. Your mouth yeah, it's a then? chemical that's inside. There's seven ingredients in crystal meth. It tastes. What? Yeah. Or you can use to make meth. Yeah. Like, so what are the ingredients? I'm not saying. <laughs> oh but it can turn like $300 into $1,000 in 20, 25 minutes if you have everything heated up. Wow. So now you said you have almost have a gangrene, but. Uh, but I just, neglected, I just neglected it. I see. I woke up and I was just like, oh, whatever. Hey, Smoke a bowl, I'm high. high. Yeah. I'm high. It doesn't matter. I don't give shit, whatever. Yeah. So then it got really bad. My arms started getting really black lines in there. Mm. Black lines. Wow. And the scab on my arm, I never really looked at my elbow with your high girl. Always walking like this. You never, yeah. never yeah. looked. My girlfriend at the time, Stephanie, had mentioned that maybe you should get your elbow checked. There was like a hockey puck on my elbow, the scab. So infected with bugs and all my body lice that yeah, I had. Pus and all oh, that. it was so bad. And when they took it off, the smell. Were you were in pain? No. Oh, because you're always high. I always pain. forget that. I always forget no that. Pain. No pain. No pain. No pain. So it was so stinky. Oh, it stunk so bad. Yeah. Oh. And yeah, if I would have left in maybe 48 hours, I probably would have lost my arm. I was so high, I didn't care. My girlfriend all the time, all she did was scratch tickets. Crossword tickets, you know the scratch tickets? Yes, yes, yeah. So she'd follow me around, and the only thing I'd do to keep her quiet, I'd just buy her lottery tickets. Shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. I'd buy her lottery tickets. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. Just yeah. drink slurpees and just, 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 just go, we want to make money. That's all I'm doing. So she's she's always crazy. following me, right? <laughs> My buyer lottery tickets. And so, so she'd get so high in a parkade scratching lottery tickets, uh -huh. maybe 500 of them. Oh. And then she's so high again, she'll go over everyone again with a red marker. All the tickets, just to double check. <laughs> okay. Next day, smoke a bowl again, all with black marker again. <laughs> so stoned that she's just checking the tickets over well, the and over. Ticket. That's what she did. That was her. Thing when she got high, <coughs> gambling. Yeah. So then, how did you end up ended up in jail? You said you ended up in jail because you were making crystal meth. You were before. caught making crystal meth, and you said that after we had the best safety. impact on my life. Yeah. They tell Just when I got arrested right? at 21 years old, I was 79 pounds. Oh, you were not eating, right? Not because eating. Always no teeth. Well, uh, two teeth in the front. Yeah. That's it. All my teeth were off. I still got these, but that's the only ones I have left. Yeah. It, was, it was. And you said that had going to jail going to saved jail, your life. The first four months, yeah, it's all hardcore. Because you were in a withdrawal. You're still withdrawal, but I'm still getting high talking about. It. I'm still fucked. This shit. After about five six months, you hear everybody crying in there. The biggest guys, biggest addicts. I'm crying because my daughters didn't yeah. get my daughters. I was crying. I got out in 18 months in good behavior. Yeah. I got in a little bit of trouble again when I got out. The police dropped me off, drove me to the edge of Vancouver. I said, get the fuck going, keep going. <laughs> well, that was on a conditional sentence. I was supposed to go to court on Monday. And that's where my warrant comes in. Mm -hmm. That's where I set a warrant right now. It's only provincial. That's because of that. Okay. Yeah. So. So when they dropped me off and they told me just to go, I just hitchhiked out. It was beautiful. I got enough shit in Vancouver. By the time we left, every parkade was fucking gated up. There was so many security companies there. There was just nothing left. I mean, they had the firework competition. I don't know if you know about that in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. On the ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we had them on the ships. We broke into the apartment buildings. If you see on our apartment building, you'll see a little black box. It says FD on it. That's fire department. So we used to take those boxes and pop the box off, take all the keys to the entire building, every door in the building, so you have to have access. It's the fire department. 
and put plumber's putty back on it, stick it back on. The only time they're ever going to know those keys are gone is if there's a fire. Oh, That's it. They don't really I have all the keys. Party? No, oh. I have all the keys and they're all numbered. So when the firework competition come on, we grab those hotel trolleys, those big trolleys in the apartments, I just go and see people leaving as they're going to watch the fireworks and marking down their suites. And then you go and then we come see. back and we just take everything. Wow. Just rob them like that. Okay. Sell laptops, 20 bucks. So that was street. after you you came out from the jail? That was a little bit before. Right? A little bit before. Because you said... When I got out of the jail, yeah. I got into the drugs again a little bit to try to sell. Okay. But that's when they caught me. And when I got out of jail, I picked up a lot of drugs from the guy that my dealer was originally, because he wanted to give me back on the street and go sell some more drugs for me and make me some more money. Well, I got picked up by the cops right after I picked up the drugs. Not 10 steps from my dealer's house. The cops picked me up, took the drugs, put it on the ground, poured water on it as it went down the drain, and drove me and get the fuck out. Let's get out. So now, you were not brought back to the jail anymore that time? No, okay. they took me right to the edge of the city, right past Surrey. Yeah. And we just said, get going. And then you just left yeah, there? I just hitchhiked. Now, let's jump now to the story where you met uh, Joel. So when I went to Calgary, I got in a little bit of trouble. I stole a car in Calgary. <laughs> it's just really easy. It's just a lot easier back then to steal cars. I walked around with a dent puller, screwed in the ignition, popped it out. Started just like that. Yeah. 30 seconds, easy. All of this you have learned from the streets yeah. like it. Easy, it's just stuff. something we have to do. You know, breaking into anywhere, you can get in anywhere with vice grips, flathead. I can pick a lock in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Those are all just things you don't forget. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's just stuff you don't forget. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Calgary, I got in the shit, I had to do house arrest for six months. Mm -hmm. So house arrest, they come at any time of the day, they call your phone come out, you hold your card up, my number is 71446. They shine a light in your face, make sure you're there. Okay, let's see. You go back downstairs, they can come back 10 seconds later. Because you might think that they're not gonna come back for a while. Oh, well, I can go do whatever I want. I'm on house arrest, they're not gonna come back, they were just here. Bullshit, they'll come right back. They're always checking. You can't go anywhere but church and grocery shopping. And you get to tell them the time when you go, and they will check sometimes. You're not there. That's it. So then I started working at a butcher shop. Oh, that's when you this started working. This is when working. I met her. She was a little chicken cutter. Most beautiful woman I ever seen in my life. Oh, no. <laughs> now we were in the lab story portion. But, but my face, I'm still very skinny. My face, I got no teeth. Yeah. Tell I, us about the date, okay? So I don't smile ever when I had no teeth. Yeah. I always cover my face. I had a mole here, a mole here. I was very insecure about my body. I never, ever smiled. Ever. Very first time I see her, I want to show off kind of thing, and I run around the corner in the shop and I jump like a chair like this. Oh, I fell right on my face. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. You I fell. Crashed right on my face. So after working with her for a little bit, we kind of fell in love, and I knew right away as soon as I see her, I'm going to marry this woman. Mm -hmm. Somehow she's going to fall in love with me. Somehow. I don't know how it happened, but she did. Mm -hmm. We're here. We had a nice place in Calgary, everything was going good. Everything is great. Then we had two young kids. I had gotten a physical education with my butcher, my boss. It was something so stupid. I lost my cool flip to table, lost my $27 an hour job. Over 10 minutes of freaking out. Best job I ever had in my life. First time I ever had a business card. First time I ever had a job. First time I ever had a bachelor pad. It was just awesome. That time when I got my first paycheck and locked my door, I cried for about you four hours. It's the first time I ever got to lock a door. Yeah. That was just, oh, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. Nothing in my house, nothing. So you tell us about your day for so, first time. Working, <laughs> at this, working at this butcher shop, we had access to a lot of the four or five star restaurants. Mm -hmm. So Mercado in Calgary is a big restaurant, it's a big Italian restaurant. I was working as a butcher. They didn't put me out on the street because of my face. I had sunk the teeth, but I had a really good work ethic. It was just awesome. So I was able to take her on all these dates, these four or five star restaurants, where we didn't have to wait in line. 
because we were the meat man, right? Yeah, yeah. We were the supplier of all these restaurants. Yeah, so they know Calgary you. Flames, downtown Calgary. Yeah. We went there, got VIP treatment everywhere we went. But I still only had one freaking tooth in my mouth. Yeah. Still okay. looked like a. Two ones and two. Well, I had two at the time, <laughs> but it was. I still looked like a freaking crackhead. Just still, I still looked skinny. Still wasn't putting on any weight. Still malnourished. Like it was just, it was horrible. So then the kids, I ended up losing that job. The sheriffs were gonna come to our door and seize all of our stuff. I'm like, we were so far behind. We were so far behind, we didn't know what to do. We got two babies. What are we gonna do? Well, we ended up leaving at like two in the morning with a pickup truck with a thousand bucks, box of diapers and a pack of wipes. And we drove all the way to Manitoba. Her mom drove us all the way to Manitoba. All the way there. Went and stayed at a friend's house for a little bit with the kids. I went downtown, got a job as soon as I could. Still stay at the friends. First paycheck, went and rented our place. Now what are we gonna do? We have a place, we don't have any furniture. We have this big house, 790 bucks. Five bedroom house, it was awesome. Big old yard, everything. Then the coke started coming around. We started having a little bit of friends and somebody brought some coke over. And That's when you started a coke. I was like, well, what the fuck is this? I did a line for the first time. I was like, Shh, this is freaking awesome. And I'm like, well, I know how to sell drugs. Where's your dealer? So he's I'm not telling you my phone dealer. I went and found him myself. I took over all his shit and I started selling coke. In a couple of months, my kids were getting like two or three hundred dollar allowances a week because I just wanted to keep them away. Because we were just so high all the time. And they were going to their friends and we would just pay for everything. And you know, suddenly my son was like nine years old, my daughter was seven. And some of the weekends we'd have two, three hundred people over, and there'd still be a big bowl of magic mushrooms outside. The camper that we had had coke all over the table. And my son came in one day and was like, Dad, I counted 84 beer cans outside. And right then he was like, Oh, like, what the fuck are you doing? So at this point, we're picking up, you know, good chunks of cocaine and, you know, moving them pretty good, and life's pretty good. I'm only getting four hours sleep every week. Waking up like half an hour before work and going to work. Blowing my nose so much. So you go, so both are going to work yet. And so yeah. what were you doing this She time? was really at home. Yeah, that was a stay at home. She, she didn't really have to do it. Lunch lady for the school. Lunch lady for the school. But still, we're doing So when you're being a mother with two children and then you're having this cooking party, you we, were we couldn't stop. With her? No, we couldn't stop. We're so, we're so and you're into it. Fine too. Yeah. Always hot. Yeah. And everywhere we went, oh, Jesse. Go to the bathroom. Go the bathroom all the time. So we always, I always give it away. And I always made good money. Always, always, always. And then my son came that one day. Dad, there's like 80 some beer cans out there. And right then, I was like, like my son's going to be 10 years old. He definitely seen the coke on the can. Like, he definitely seen it. There's no way you can fucking see it. Mm. It's right there. He doesn't know what it is, but he, he could have licked that or he could have whatever. Yeah. So okay. at that time, we were like, well, I was like, fuck this. I said, I'm done. She's like, well, you're not ready. Oh, She's not ready. You were still hooked on that. She was still hooked on it. So this is six months before we moved to Ontario. I had told my boss the next day, I said, you know what? I'm fucking quitting. I said, I'm done. Six months, I'm moving to Ontario because I don't know anybody. Fuck this shit. I quit. I told my dealer, I said, I'm fucking done. My wife's not done yet, but I'm done soon. So we sat there and worked two more months, she was doing it. Just kept giving it to her, I'm taking care of the kids. I'm getting kind of pissed off that it's not stopping. So about two months later, she's finally done. So she we're was, done. We are, we're already here we're in done. So as soon as we're done with the cocaine, I didn't have one fucking friend come back. Nobody. Not on the weekend, not one person. Mm -hmm. Not one person. So by the time the six months was up, they always call my bluff. Well, you're not gonna throw your shit away. Oh, well, there's no way, no way. The day that we left, Two people seen us off. Two people that have never been to our parties. Mm -hmm. Nothing. The most soberest people that we, we know, and it was my son's friend's parents that came and helped us pack and move away. Mm -hmm. We packed everything up. We left halfway between Manitoba and Ontario here, just past, what's that first town coming out of the border? Kenora or Kenora? Kenora? Yeah. Well, that lake right there, I had my cell phone. I bet you 3,000 contacts in there. Nothing but money in this phone. I threw that so far in the water. What a feeling. 
Now you were relieved. There is that. relief. Yeah, so we finally get to Ontario that. here. We come here to be closer to her father. Her father disowned her when she was younger. Yeah. The mother is in Alberta. So we here with her mother. We came up here for her to be closer to her father and for him to meet his grandkids, the two kids we have now. We come all the way up here. Yeah. Little Caesar's Pizza, everything was going good. Relationships going good. Mm -hmm. Kind of weird a little bit, because I don't really like the guy. Well, in Little Caesar's, I was with her with my daughter. We are getting food. Well, her father comes in. Usually he would say hi and everything else. He looked at my daughter and didn't say a word. He just walked right by her. And we made her cry. My daughter came home crying. I was like, that fuck. So I went, I got in the car. I parked in front of his place, right on uh, Charles Street in Ingersoll. Mm -hmm. Stopped to grab the car. I said, you fucking deadbeat motherfucker. Just get the fuck outside. And every morning I drive by. What the fuck up, you motherfucker? Every morning. Every morning. Three weeks later, he moved to Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia? He took Hello. off. He, took off. Her. he just left, scared okay. for his life, and just took off. But when you moved here, did you start to work already as a butcher? When I moved here, I got a job <laughs> at Cam. We're Happy. getting for Robinson. We're getting for Robinson cleaning. Oh, for a clean job. Shitty job. <laughs> Fucking shitty job. <laughs> Work at nighttime and cleaning whatever it is. It's 15 bathrooms and not one employee working throughout the night. We have to clean the bathrooms three times a night. Yeah, even if it's clean. Not even one person working. It was absolutely ridiculous. So then I called and I was like, I need to find another job. He called me to us right away. And I got to meet him his job, and then the last little bit is a dealer from Manitoba had found out where we lived here in Ingersoll and had sent me a kilo of cocaine not too long ago. We kept it in our closet when we were living on Thames, on 2271 Thames. The money was getting a little bit tough. I was having a tough time at the market. We had that kilo of coke in our, in our closet for three or four months, and we just sent it back like eight months ago. Done. We haven't touched it. We don't want anything to do with it. The phone is gone, but all that business is is gone. Yeah. So I just want to share to you one one story. Um, when Crystal and uh, Jesse was were on a date. Oh, Joel. Joel. Oh, Joel. 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 Was Joel. No, there's no Crystal. <laughs> it's just me. So they he was eating a, a popsicle. So yeah, it was like those strawberry fruit popsicles. Yeah, he hasn't got only one too. I had two. Oh, okay, yeah. two. <laughs> Fighting into that thing and my teeth was stuck in it. Oh, stuck on the popsicle. Oh. Broke right into it. But still, Joel loves it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she got with me when I had no teeth. I was 85 pounds. She stuck with me the whole time. And yeah. we've been together 18 years now. That's good. Now, uh, we're going to have a question or are we good? Do you have any questions? Maybe well, the question three? was, what can we do? Yeah, what can we do to help people, people like this? Like night you programs, programs help. For night? Night programs. Night Somewhere programs. Somewhere for people to go at night time is yeah. a huge thing. Okay. At night time, all people seen. have to do is crime and drugs. What else is there to do? There's nowhere to go. No, so for people who are into drugs, how do we help them to, you know, stay away from it or give it up? Or not? What, what program? You can't expect them to come to you. You no, gotta go to them. To so they're we, not gonna come to you for help. They're always too high. What the fuck do you wanna go there for? They're embarrassed. So Nobody wants how, to go. like for us, the Rotarians here, we have a program, like Transitional Home, and we wanted to help these people. We don't know how to approach these people. We don't know how to really help them. To have a, you can't be scared of them. They're not people to be scared of. So they're people that hate help. Like so just we just happens. have to talk to them? You just yeah. have to talk to them. I'm sure you're going to get that one bad apple that's really angry and that, but you're going to get those other 10 people that actually want help, yeah. that yeah. are not willing to go out and get it because they're ashamed of it. Yeah. Especially yeah. Christmas time and everything else. Nobody wants to go for help. Nobody. It's a fucking so they, embarrassment. So the help that we're giving them, like we have a community table. Every Saturday we feed these people. They, yeah. That's helping them. Yeah. And also during December, Christmas time, we have a dinner for them. And we also give them some stuff like meetings and all. Yeah. That is a big help for them. Contact information, places where they go for jobs. There's a thing that they had in uh, Vancouver where homeless people can go at this one spot where people like that own businesses can hire people for the day and just take them for the day. 
and drop them off at the end of the day, you just give them 60 bucks for the day, kind of. So how, what can we do to improve their lives? And really, you don't have a help like we did, what happened? Is it like, we, can we help them? Or is it really their decision that they want You can, you just gotta approach them. You gotta really talk to them. Yeah, so You're not gonna know to, unless you talk to them. Yeah, we need to have- I have a question for you. How would you feel safe to talk to someone within that case? That's a very, uh, it's hard to answer that one. <coughs> okay, what, what's the what's, uh, signs for me that I am not Because I know when I was on the streets and all the people that I've talked to, yeah, they're all people that, most of them were just runaways and most of them just had a bad, just lost their job and they're just kind of stuck in that rut. It's very rare that any of them have chose to be there. None of them have chose to Absolutely be there. Absolutely right. And they're all willing to take help. If I didn't have kids, I'd be bringing in people every time I can. But it's, you gotta talk to them. You look at the younger people, younger people where there's still hope. A lot of the older people that look really rough, maybe they choose to be there because it's an easier life for them. It's just, they haven't figured out. Can you educate me? How can I break that cycle? How can I have emotion first? Like, you know, what, what's the first thing I should do? Like, See what we did. Brandon, we've seen a homeless couple. We went and offered to take them out for something to eat. And it really got to know them on that level. Away from the streets and away from wherever. Take them to a place where it's public. Offer them some food. Find some insight on their personal life where they're not feeling so defensive when they're on the streets. A lot of people are very... Take the wall down. Yeah, a lot of people will open up. Take just, the wall down. But just everybody has a wall. All the homeless people have a wall. When you go up and say anything, they're going to say, you be very aggressive because that's what they deal with all night. The cops swearing at them, this and that. You take one aside and actually show some interest in helping them, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Sympathy, you'd be surprised. Yeah. They just need a little bit of attention, a little bit of. Yes, Peter. So, Joe, uh, what, what uh, you have a job now? Yeah, I work at Vietnamese in Embro. Okay, and check. how long have you been there now? Two and a half years. Excellent. And I work at Woodstock Market in Saturday. Excellent. Yeah, he owns a car now. Great. They're renting a good house in Universal. Both kids are in school. Here. Both of those kids are in school. My older daughters from Vancouver both done college and university. And, and he's keeping in touch every day. And so he's he, so yeah. there is hope for them. We just have to. You just have to get it tough. It's just getting a break. Me, I went to jail. That's what saved my life. That was enough time for me to sober up and realize that my kids are gone. And I, there's nothing to go back to. to. Once you get in that drug circle, it's, it's you gotta sober up to get out of it. Yeah. If you're surrounded by the drugs, you're not getting out of it. Yeah. You need to be taken away from there and actually just talk to people. You just gotta, they're not scary. They're people that need help, that's all. Yeah, they sometimes they just they said need a hug. Yeah. You heard it from Charlie. They need an address. Some need a hug. Some need an attention. Some, some of them don't have IDs because a lot of people steal their IDs. Yeah. They help somebody get their ID if you want to. You can't do nothing with your ID. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people get their wallet stolen. A lot of people sell their IDs. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want um, to uh, thank uh, my mask to uh, uh, thank you guys for coming out. It's, uh, it's yeah, to hear stories of um, Jesse and Joel, uh, it's eye-opening for a lot of us. Um, lot, most of us haven't gone through these things, and it is uh, heartwarming actually how you went through it, how you got out of it. And uh, you know, there is hope for everyone. Right? There is hope for everyone, and we all need to work on that. Um, I really want to. Uh, Thank you from our club and the people here for sharing your story because it is very important that that story gets shared and that we get a little bit of insight of, of, of how it works and how we can possibly help. And I apologize for this for it. Children properly express themselves. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so it, 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 if you speak again, it's better to try to suppress that a little bit. <laughs> If you can, uh, but uh, no, uh, but we really appreciate you that you took the courage to speak out about your mistakes, and uh, not many people want to own up to their mistakes, and uh, we uh, really appreciate it, and, and hopefully we learn at it with it that we can uh, help other people on the street. So uh, 
Let's give them a big thank you.